Well, that was just a tiny little uh, preview, a little window into some of the things that we do in Guatemala. <clears throat> this spring, um, my wife Carol and I had the wonderful privilege of going down to Guatemala again. This uh, was about our, I think, our, our fourth uh, trip to Guatemala. And we go into an area that's uh, about, oh, two and a half hours from the uh, capital uh, city of Guatemala. It's in a mountain village about uh, 5,000 feet elevation. It's a very beautiful country. But it's uh, also inhabited by many, many villages with very poor uh, native uh, people that are descendants of the Mayan culture. There's many, many uh, uh, tribal uh, groups with different dialects. Um, most of them do speak Spanish uh, somewhat. But these are, are, are indigenous people that uh, have been abused by their own government and have been uh, basically ignored. Uh, they, they have very poor health uh, health care and very limited resources. So our hearts have gone out to these people, especially uh, to reach them with the gospel and with help that we can give. Uh, we as uh, Americans are blessed with so many blessings in this country, we take all of that for granted. But these folks don't have even sometimes the basic necessities of life. And we have, uh, our hearts have been drawn to them and, uh, and we have been blessed to be able to go. And so uh, Carol would like to say something here. We want to pray. We just want to ask the Holy Spirit to be with us this morning before we share with you our experience down in Guatemala. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you so much that you love us, no matter where we live, no matter our social status, uh, no matter what we've done, where we've come from, you love us and you, and you count us as your children, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity Robin and I have had to meet these people, become their friends, to help them, to sh shed your light of love to them, Lord. Thank you and uh, bless us today, may we truly show your love and the, the powerful uh, things you're doing in that little town. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Just a few um, um, thoughts um, as we um, share our experience. Um, how many of you are convinced by the things that you're experiencing this year and the things that you're hearing on the news and the pressures you're feeling from society and government and um, the restrictions. How many of you are feeling the closeness of Jesus' second coming? I think that we all agree that um, <clears throat> the signs uh, are everywhere. And uh, I've recognized uh, more than ever, uh, ever before that um, things have moved quickly, so quickly um, to restrict uh, human movement and human freedom that I think that we can see how quickly things can change in our world. I mean, they can, they can change overnight. And so um, it kind of puts a new perspective on why we're here as a people. Adventism and, the, and Christianity is a movement. It started out as a movement. When Jesus came on this earth, he gathered a few disciples and he began to, to leave a message that the kingdom of heaven has come. And he invited his disciples and then those, those disciples shared with others and soon it became a movement um, there's a word that goes with movement. Who can tell me what that word is? Any ideas what the word is? It's, it, it, it's the word that uh, causes movement. Yeah, move? Well, it's the word go. 
And Jesus used this word. I wanted to read something to you. And um, it's, it's come back to me over and over. Um, but it's only been recently. I've been an Adventist. I, I'm a fifth generation Adventist. But I have um, never experienced this uh, so personally as this, the last couple of years of my life uh, in a very personal way. Uh, the Lord says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts, and my ways higher than your ways. Just as the rain and snow came down, come down from heaven and don't return until the earth is watered, causing it to sprout and spring forth, for the water for, for, to spring forth for the eater and seeds for the sower, so the word goes out of my mouth, and it will not return unto me empty, but it will carry out my wishes and succeed in doing what it, I sent it out to do. Um, do you believe that? Do you believe when God says something, it's going to do what he says it's going to do? When he uh, told Moses to hold his rod out over the Red Sea and it would part, did it part? And when he told Joshua to march the, the um, priests with the ark over to the, to the Jordan and step in it, and it would open up, did it open up? It did. It did exactly what he said it would do. And it's still happening. So I'd like to read Revelation here. For, uh, excuse me, from Matthew. It says, All power in heaven and earth has been given to me. So go and tell people of all nations the good news and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them everything I've taught you. I'll always be with you, even into the end of the world. And I think we're getting close to the end of the world. Um, I'll have more to say about this in just a few minutes, but um, the challenge is on. I think that Jesus challenged his disciples uh, he showed them what he could do, and when he told the demons to leave, they would leave. When he healed people, they were absolutely healed, and he said, go take this message to the whole world. So I really feel privileged. Uh, the few things that the Lord has given me as um, abilities uh, are really, I feel small. And when I had the opportunity to go to Guatemala, the Lord opened up that to me. I said, well, what can I do? I don't have much to offer. In fact, um, the first trip that Carol and I took uh, on our own without a group going with us, we normally go with a group of 30 or 40 people. But the Lord impressed on us to go just on our own, just got our tickets and went to Guatemala because he, he impressed us that Jesus went about, um, he mingled with the people as one who desired their good. And he impressed us to go with that in mind. And um, we, we saw how God opened doors for us to uh, make friends <clears throat> in Guatemala. And it wasn't anything dramatic. Uh, lightning didn't come from heaven or any awesome thing like that. But we started making friends, and we saw how God opened doors and opened hearts. We didn't even know the language well, but it didn't matter. Uh, we were able to start touching people, and, and we saw uh, some amazing things happen while we were there. Uh, hearts were opened. Other people began to be connected to our, our small group of friends in Guatemala. And now we have what we consider a family of friends in Guatemala. And each time we go, that group of friends grows. And uh, God is blessing. Uh, and the little church in Colise wasn't even there five years ago. There was zero 
Adventists in Colise five years ago. Now there's about 35 meeting in Colise. God is moving. He's, um, he's definitely powerful and working just like he was in the early church. So we want to show you some pictures of our recent trip and try to light a fire under you to go someplace. Maybe it's to your neighbor. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's to Africa, who knows. God will inspire you. Just ask him where he wants to send you. So, um, this uh, first slide here is uh, a picture inside of our building on some property. I, we reported earlier in an earlier um, report that uh, property was donated to Broken Chains for Humanity. That's the small group, uh, nonprofit group that we're working with. We're all Adventists um, working uh, in this region of Guatemala. This land, uh, approximately 17 acres, was donated by a very generous uh, Guatemalan man who's not even an Adventist because he wants to see clinic work uh, developed in this area for his people. And this is the first building. It's a large um, structure. It's like a large uh, uh, utility garage. Um, I'll show pictures of it from a distance so you can get perspective. But this is to house uh, two um, mobile clinics. One of them is currently somewhere in Mexico right now. It's on its way. A driver is driving it down. And it will be parked probably where, where this truck is is parked right now. Um, this man standing next to me, is, his name is Santos. He's a very, very uh, skilled um, contractor. He worked with me on this last trip. And the amazing thing is that I went down there with a list of six things that Mark Juarez gave me to work on if I was able to uh, to get them accomplished. They were, they were physical projects, building projects, and uh, <clears throat> I didn't know the language well. I didn't know any contacts there as far as uh, how I would accomplish this. We did a lot of praying. We did a lot of praying, and God opened doors. And this man was, um, became available, and he was a godsend. He was very, very good at what he did, and seemed to know intuitively how to work with me, even though he didn't know any English. And uh, anyway, next slide. This is the second man that the Lord put in our lives. Uh, this is another perspective of this garage. You can see the two doors that open into the building. Um, this man's name is Elvis. Uh, his mother uh, loved Elvis Presley. His last name, by the way, is Rias. In Spanish, that means king. Elvis king. <laughs> Elvis is king. So it's kind of a humorous thing. But Elvis is a very, very uh, generous man. He's very uh, humorous. He's a delight to work with, and he knows English pretty well. He worked in Indiana for a few years. And he hasn't been back there for years, but his English is quite good. And he was a godsend to work with me because he was able to translate uh, where we had difficulty getting um, concepts. Uh, so he was a big help to me. And uh, God brought him into our lives. And we've been very close over the, a two-year period now. And we're praying for, we're praying for Santos and um, Elvis every day in our prayers. Because God's word goes out, and it doesn't come back to him void. And so we went and we took God's love with us every day to these men. And so I know that God is working in their hearts. He saw us working and he saw the love. I had some really good conversations with uh, Elvis every day as we went up to the property to work. It's about 20 minute drive from Colise to our property. And we had some very good spiritual talks going up there. So I know that God is working. His, Word doesn't come back void, so I know that something is happening in his life. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is a gentleman from Colise who's uh, delivering materials for our building project. 
Uh, next slide. This is some of the materials, bags of cement, uh, some special uh, fire bricks for a stove, a native uh, type of stove. You'll see a picture of it in a minute. Uh, next slide. These are blocks. They're not really high quality blocks, but they're cement blocks that were bought several years ago and we're utilizing them for a special, um, it's called a bodega or special vault. Uh, it's like a big uh, pantry for special uh, expensive tools that we're gonna be moving down there to do projects with. And since thievery is kind of a problem in that country, we have to make sure that the expensive tools are secure. So we're making a special place for that. You'll see in the next picture. Uh, here's the beginning of that uh, project. Uh, Santos is uh, securing the corner with rebar. Uh, next picture. We had two helpers. Uh, these uh, boys uh, were really hard workers. Their names are Freddy and Freddy. <laughs> And they were really great. Uh, couldn't speak any English, but they worked hard. Uh, workers down there work uh, hard all day, a lot of times a 10-hour day, and their wages amount in, 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 uh, in dollars, uh, usually about $8 for a day's work. And uh, that's good wages, by the way. We paid them very fair wages. It was top dollar for for uh, Guatemala laborers. They were very happy to get it because COVID was beginning to make its inroads there. A lot of businesses were closing up and these boys were really happy to work. This is a picture. They're holding their victory fingers up because the wall is at full height now. They're just, we're just getting ready to make the top. Uh, there's a reinforced concrete lid gonna be poured on this bodega uh, between this wall and the uh, the wall of the garage. Uh, next picture. We also have a, uh, a bathroom that was uh, built probably, I think, about four years ago at least, four or five years ago. But the cows kept breaking the fence down and they would come and get in the bathrooms and mess things up, break things up. So we decided to build a retaining wall around the, kind of make a little courtyard around the bathroom so the cows couldn't break in. So this is the project in, in progress here. Uh, next picture. Again, uh, near completion, uh, Elvis and Freddie and Freddie there working. Next picture. At the end of the project, we had a, a, a craftsman in town build a fancy little gate uh, so that uh, we could get in to the bathrooms. There's uh, two bathrooms, a, man, a men and women's bathroom and a shower. And these will be uh, available for workers and um, staff when we eventually get our clinic built here on the property. Uh, this is Santos and this is uh, again uh, Elvis. Uh, Elvis by trade is a painter and he saw that the doors were getting uh, a little corroded and rusty. so I. We went to the hardware store, we got some paint, and he did a very nice job of painting, repainting the doors while we were there. Um, God has, God blessed me the whole time I was there. It was one week before I was even able to find the very first man to contact to get any of the jobs done. And we were only there, gonna be there a month. So one week has gone, no projects done. And I had six projects. Somehow, God provided the people, the contacts. We were able to get all six, and we were able to get all six projects done in the limited time we had because God provided the people. And they had a delight, we had a delightful time working together. They just loved working. They thought I was the greatest boss ever. I don't know why, but uh, I did bring them pastries every morning, and they thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> Anyway, next, next slide. Uh, this is uh, what they call a stufa. It's, it's, a, it's a stove made native style uh, where the, your wood is stored underneath the stove and then there's an ashtray. 
underneath this section and the, the, the fire is built in that little section on top. Uh, anyway, there'll be a ne the next picture will show you a little bit more. Uh, the top has been poured here and uh, it's ready for tile work now. Uh, this picture shows a lady that's a Bible worker and she's basically the head elder, the preacher. The, she's a, a motivated lady, Adventist lady that um, <clears throat> essentially holds the Adventist church together in Colise. Her name is Sophia, really hard worker, dedicated lady. Um, she's here with us. Next slide. This is the pretty much the finished product. Uh, Santos did a fabulous job of uh, doing tile work on top of that. So the finished stove. We put a stove in this garage with the idea that um, the first stages of our project, we might actually have people camping out in this big building and might need a place to prepare some food. And this would be a quick, easy way to uh, fix some meals. And I think the next picture will show some more. This is the finished stove, and uh, we tested it out. We actually built a fire in there, and it worked just fine. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> this is a picture of our friend Clark. Uh, we had some uh, visitors from the United States came down a few days, I guess a week after we were there. And uh, Clark and Elizabeth and a friend of theirs uh, showed up, so we put them to work. And uh, one of the projects that Mark wanted accomplished was to take one of the leveled areas for one of the um, uh, bunk houses. We're going to build some bunk houses so workers that come down to work uh, on the clinics will have a place to stay when they come. So this level uh, piece of ground is going to be the future site of a bunk house. It'll, uh, it'll probably house uh, 8 to 12 uh, workers along with a, uh, a family. So Clark is helping me lay out the corners to this building in this picture. Next slide. Again, we're getting close to having the corners established. A lot of measuring and remeasuring. We're just about to get rained on here in this picture. Next, next slide. This is the finished project and it's starting to rain on us. High in the mountains, it's uh, almost 8,000 feet. It is 8,000 feet elevation here. There's pines and many other beautiful trees at this elevation, and it frequently rains in the afternoon up here. So we were able to lay out all the corners, and um, that's what it looks like. We, we bought flour in town and, and highlighted the, the string layout with uh, flour so you could get a good picture of it. Okay, next. This is kind of a final picture of, of my, my pictures that I'm going to talk about. This is just a, a, a picture of the, the garage uh, from a distance there with the ramps. We did a little uh, work getting the ramps. Uh, it had been a step up to get into the garage, so now the, the, the uh, ambulance will be able to get into the garage, uh, hopefully when it gets there this next week. So, in summing up my, my experience there for the uh, few, uh, few weeks that we were able to do these projects, we worked on a stove, a sink, uh, a spring. There was a spring donated to us on this, uh, next, next to this property that was uh, for our use for the clinic. And um, we did some work on that spring. Um, we did the layout of the, of the building, uh, did some ramp work here, and we did the bodega. The bodega was a big project. All of that happened in a little over three weeks, and I give the credit to the Lord for that. Um, I had done uh, construction work earlier in my experience. The, my last 20 years, I was a registered nurse, but um, the Lord provided the people and the contacts in the town. Irregardless of whether I could speak Spanish well or not, the Lord provided the people to get this, these jobs done. And it seems like a small thing. Construction is, 
in the scope of eternity, what's, what's a little construction work? But God cares about what we're doing. He cares about things, and he cares about building our faith. And uh, who knows in the large scope of things whether um, it's the souls that he saves in Guatemala or our own souls. Sometimes it's both. And I just want to praise God for what he's doing in Guatemala. I'm going to turn the rest of the time to Carol here. Next slide. This is on the way to the property, this road. Uh, and we hired some guys to help us clear, clear it up because the, tr the bus has a hard time going through this road when you can hardly get a car through it. And uh, so we hired some people to, some guys to come and do that. Next slide. They have a machete and they don't know how to use that thing and they're strong and I was just so amazed how those guys worked and how they cleaned it up. It was, it was, oh, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> Next slide. One of the things that we weren't planning on doing because we got there the first, second or third of March and um, we were expecting the group to come on the 18th of March and do a big clinic go to the mountains, do clinics in the mountains. And usually we have 30 to 40 people. We have doctors and we have dentists and we have PAs and we have a lot of people with a lot of experience that have done this before. So we got there and then COVID-19 hit and they wouldn't let anybody come. So the trip was totally canceled for them. We were already there, but Sophia, you met Sophia, She'd been telling all her contacts and all her Bible study people that we were going to do a medical clinic. And we're like, we only had Robin, was a nurse, and um, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, they were nurses. And we thought, I don't know how we can do this. We prayed about it. We talked about it. We tried to think of how we could do this. We talked to Ron Cook, who is our CEO, and, and uh, he said, well... If you, if, if you think that God's leading you to do that, he said, we'll support you. Whatever you need, you let us know. And uh, so we said, I guess the Lord's leading us to do that. So uh, Sophia offered her home because of the COVID. Um, we actually weren't supposed to do a big clinic because everything was shutting down at 4 o'clock. You had to be in your motel or in your home at 4 o'clock. And if you weren't, you were fined or, sent to, or taken to jail. So it was very important to be in your home by 4. <laughs> and so we, um, like I said, we prayed about it. And Oscar, our friend that gave us the land up on the hill, he talked to the mayor, who is a friend of his, and the mayor said, fine. He gave us permission to do that. So we sat around talking about our parameters because usually when we do the big clinics, we'll have, I don't know, 200 people, 250 people a day. Well, we no way we could do that. So we, t we all talked together and Sophia said, I'll just, we'll go by invitation and we'll only, we'll only schedule 10 people per hour. And we were open from 10 to 3, I think, right? 10 to 3. So, by God's grace, we did it, and Sophia knew people that would help with translating, and that was the, uh, the ladies that uh, took all the people in it, and they showed them how to brush their teeth, they gave them fluoride treatments. This is Sophia and her husband. They did the glasses, and they give away free reading glasses, and, and it's really neat when the old people come in and they can't see, and, and they get glad and they can see. It's, it's, it's really rewarding. Next slide. And this is a, a lady that lives there, real nice, Rebecca. She is, um, I'm thinking, she, tech. she's a pharmaceutical tech, yes. So she was in charge of all the, um, the medicines, the prescriptions and all that. And uh, she didn't speak a lot of English, but she spoke Spanish. And so we kind of put her in charge of that and she did a great job. Next slide. And this is Robin's uh, interpreter. Nice guy. Robert? Was his name Robert? Robert. Robert. Nice guy, and he'd helped us before. Next slide. This is me. I did the, you know, the blood pressure, the heart rate, and all that kind of stuff for people when they walked in. I was one of the first tables they came to. The other thing we did when they walked in the door, 
we gave them a mask and we gave them, uh, put, gave them some hand sanitizer so they could, everything was, you know, try to keep everything clean as much as we could and they had the mask. Uh, next slide. One of the things that we usually did, and Sophia asked if we could do it again, which is like I said, there was only a few of us, um, to go and give food and minister to the people at the dump in Jalapa. Jalapa is about an hour away and uh, it's, a t it's a city of about 40,000 people, where Colise has about 30,000. And so that's what we did. And people from this church and other churches donated money. They said, we want to help give money for the, to feed the poor people. And so, okay, we'll use that money for that. And uh, so we made it bags. Next slide, please. You can see those little green and uh, pink uh, bags along the wall there. We made up um, 31 bags and we were short, just a couple. Um, <clears throat> so there was <clears throat> probably 35 families that lived there. And we gave away toys. Next slide, please. We gave away toys and blankets, the bags of food. Um, we had prayer with them. Sophia talked to them, gave a little devotional talk to them about the Lord. And uh, it, was, it was really... Um, you feel sorry for these people, you know, you really do. Just, it's, it's really sad. But we were happy to do what we could for them. And I, I, I know God blessed. Next slide, please. That's giving away more stuff. Next slide. In the town of Colise, this lady here, she works for the city, which they call in that town, uh, mun municipal, the municipal. And um, so she, she gets, she sees a lot of people. She knows the problems in the city. She's, she's aware of what's really happening. And so she's a friend, and she takes Bible studies from Sophia. So she said, Sophia, there's a family that's really poor, and they really need help. Can we take them some food? Can your church take them some food? And she said, yeah. So we made up a, a box of food for them. I can't remember how many children she had, but she had several. But I don't know. But these babies, I don't know how old you think they might be. I thought maybe three months old. They're actually eight months old. They don't sit up by themselves. They don't crawl. They um, cute babies, but they're malnourished. And when you're malnourished, then you know you 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 are what you are. You know. So we took them some food. We gave them baby blankets. Some of you probably here maybe have made those baby blankets. And um, it was just one of the. The babies, uh, they were, I think they were twins. Yeah, so next slide. When we were there the last time, we met, uh, got to be friends with a lady, Cari uh, Chrissy, and her friend, um, Mauricio. It turns out that Mauricio, this man here, has a, uh, what they call, what is it? Impresarios ju juvenilias. Can't say it properly. But they minister to women, girls, and boys, and men that have been either abused or have no parents, they're orphans, or maybe they have addiction problems of some sort, and they teach them and train them so they can make it in the world, so they can um, get a job. They're, they're trained to, to do some kind of work. And they also... Um, Anyway, so he invited us. He wanted us to see their people and what they do, and so he invited us to their house. So we went to their house, and these all these baskets are what some of the ladies and the men make and sell to help support themselves and help support the school. And um, so he invited us, and he, he was quite happy that we had come and, uh, from the United States, and just a really nice guy. And the next slide, please. And these are some of the ladies and the men that, um, that have been trained and are learning how to make their way in the world after being abused or whatever ever situation they came from. And the man, last man on the, be your, your right, I guess, is uh, he's the assistant director and Mauricio is the director. They actually have two schools. They have uh, one in Colise and one in Guatemala City too. Next slide. And this is what, one of the things they also, is how they support their school is they uh, grow watermelons. Next slide. Oh, 
I thought I had a picture of it. Anyway, that field was all watermelon. And the girls and the men work the field. They weed, they harvest, they do everything for that field. And I saw him a few days later in town, and I asked him, so once you harvest, because he was going to harvest in April, his watermelons. And I said, so what are you going to do after you harvest? Will you plant to something else? He says, no, we'll just plant more watermelons. <laughs> it's just an ongoing thing there because the temperature is so warm that they can grow things all year round. So, so he wanted to come, they wanted to come see our property and see where we were. And so we invited them to come. And so that's uh, Mauricio and Chrissy and uh, their friend. Next. Sophia. Sophia does so much stuff. She's an inspiration to me, this lady. She um, goes twice a month before COVID. She was going twice a month feeding the senior center people that come to the senior center. She gives a devotional talk. She prays with them. She talks to them. Um, she's, like I say, she's, you know, she's just amazing. She's the head elder of the church. She preaches every week. She has a radio station twice uh, a week, and then the, when we were here there this last time, the school, one of the schools asked her if she would mind teaching the English class, because the teacher that normally does it had to be gone for surgery or something. So she taught English class in the morning for like three hours to different classes, taught English. Uh, she just loves people. She, they give, between her and her husband, they give 40 Bible studies a week. It's, it's, it's wonderful. God, God has given her this love of people and energy to do it. Next slide, please. Here's some of the seniors that were there in Colise. Next slide. And the people on, the, on your um, right would be the workers, and they're me, and then the lady between me and Sophia is the one that's the director of the senior center. And she just loves us to come. And, and they have no problem with us praying with them and, and, and giving literature to the people there. They're, they have no problem with that. Next slide. One of the things that we did when we were there this time too is we took um, Sophia and Armando to um, a training session they had in Ipala. Ipala is a uh, kind of like a Leone Meadows, but not quite as fancy, not near as fancy. <laughs> It's basically um, a huge, huge building uh, with a stage, has bathrooms, and it has a kitchen and with a big roof. And it seats probably, I don't know, 5,000 people, maybe 4,000, something like that. And then it has a big swimming pool, which you'll see later. Well, while we were there, um, they had a baptism, and it just so happened that this pastor that was doing the baptism was the, our, our pastor from Colise, except how many churches do you think he has? Wild guess? Anybody? He has 23 churches. So you might see your pastor every how many months? <laughs> so they don't see him very often, so that's why Sophia does most of the preaching. But they had this really neat baptism. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, see that beautiful swimming pool. And uh, that's where they had their baptisms. And a whole family was baptizing. It was very moving. And it was uh, just, it was just, I was really touched by that. And um, this, this pastor, um, he, he's really nice man, really nice man. Next slide. And we took these ladies with us. They also wanted to come. Uh, uh, Sophia asked us if we, if we would take them, and we said, yeah. And, and uh, she said, oh, my friend called. Can you pick her up? And we said, yeah. And that was Berta. She's between Sophia and me. And then another, pretty soon her other lady called and said, can you pick me up? And we said, well, I guess. We're in the truck, you know. <laughs> And we had a big back seat in the back. So the other lady in the white jacket, that's actually the, uh, an attorney for the, for the conference there. She's a lawyer. And we just had a good time together, and I just love those people. They're, they were just really nice to meet them and get to know them. And then the lady, when we picked up Berta, she said, oh, my grandson's with me. Can we squeeze him in? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we squeezed them in, too. Next slide. And when we were taking... Um, 
uh, them back through, they said, uh, oh, we gotta stop at this new church. This is the, uh, the fifth new church in Jalapa. Jalapa, like I say, is 40,000 people. And um, people don't have cars there a lot. I mean, you see cars, but people don't really own a lot of cars compared to us. So you have to have a lot of churches in the city because people walk to church or they take a bus or they, they, they can't just drive 30 miles to the, to the church. So uh, they take a taxi or something to get to church. So uh, this was a new church. Very nice, the nicest church I've ever seen in Guatemala. Next slide. The other thing we did there was we gave um, food and uh, to, to people. We found out that there were some people up in the mountains that didn't have no food. They were having a drought. And uh, so we went up and, and gave, you'll see several pictures of that. Go ahead. The circus came to town when we were there, and they were loud at night, and they were noisy, and you know, the, the sound just circulates all over the place. And we were kind of like, oh, you know. Well, as everything shut down, these people are traveling circus. So they go from town to town. Well, once everything shut down, they couldn't go from town to town. They were stuck. They couldn't have a circus because of the COVID, so it had no way of earning money. And they had about nine or 10 people that were with the circus and they couldn't afford to buy any food after a while. They were, they were out of food. So we took them some food and we began to understand, you know, this is how they made their living. Whether they're loud or noisy, God loves them and they were starving. So we took them some food. Praise the Lord. Next slide. Now this, this is Oxel. Oxel was just baptized after we left the, uh, in March. He was baptized in another lady. He has trouble with his eyes, but the surgery can fix his eyes. So after COVID happened, they weren't able to schedule anything, but um, he is scheduled sometime, hopefully now that COVID's coming down, that he'll be able to go to Guatemala City and get that eye surgery. We have people donating for that, and I don't know if you're in a position where you can help with that, and if you want to, that's fine. Um, I'm sure that would be appreciated, but uh, he's a fine kid. He, he comes to church, and um, I think he's the only one in his family that comes. Um, I think we give Bible studies to the mother and the father, and I think that's how he, he got into the Bible studies, and then he wanted to be baptized. Next slide. This is more people up in the mountains that we took, um, we took food to. We gave out 85 bags of food. We were busy all afternoon, and the people were so appreciative. You see how they live there in little, um, Mud house. like, yeah, adobe houses with tin roofs and stuff. And then I carried blankets, baby blankets, and a few toys and, and stuff, and I would give them to the kids when we, we came to them. Next slide. More helpers. Some of these boys are the boys that um, Mauricio, and that's how we heard about these people, because Mauricio heard that they were in a drought up there and they needed food and water. So uh, he asked us if we wanted to help. We said, sure. So we donated some money from Broken Chains and uh, people that give us money to help with this kind of a thing. And so that's what we did. So we had a nice group of men to help us. Next slide. So after everything shut down in Guatemala, we're driving along in the truck, and this is social distancing in Guatemala. They, about, they couldn't take the buses. The buses hold about 40 people. There's about 15 people in that truck. Yeah, there's about 15 people in the truck. They couldn't take the public transit. They couldn't take the public vans. So if you had a truck and you're willing to haul somebody somewhere, pile in. <laughs> Next slide. Now this is a long story, but I'll try to make it short. When we made our flight tickets to leave Guatemala, we made it with American Airlines. They said, don't call American Airlines until a week before. So I called American Airlines a week before and everything was fine. And then about three days before we were supposed to leave, I got a text saying, all your flights, all your flights are canceled. I'm going, what? How are we gonna get out? And uh, so then, uh, our friends, Elizabeth and Clark, they were there and said, well, we're going Valeris. And I said, okay, well, we'll try them. So I tried them, yes. We got, a, we got one for, oh, in a few days, just a few days. 
The night before we were supposed to leave with Polaris, they texted me and said, all flights are canceled. I'm like, what are we, so we were praying. We were really praying. And um, so finally, um, our friends, they got canceled and before us, and so they, they had gone with United. And he said, why don't you try United? And we said, okay. So I tried United. There was only 10 seats left. So we got two. And um, so then we had to return our rental truck. So we went to return the rental truck at the airport. The airport is locked. There's nothing happening at the airport. The rental place where the office where you go to give your car, you know, the key back and everything and pay, nothing. Nobody was there. There were some guards at the parking lot. They said everything's closed down. Like, what are we going to do? So our friends were with us and they said, we're going to take a taxi and go to the motel. We said, okay, good, fine, we'll be there in a few minutes. We'll get a taxi or a, a, a shuttle. The hotel was supposed to have a shuttle. So we'll take the shuttle. So we called the hotel, called the hotel. Nobody answered. So, uh, and, um, so we saw this police car go by, or police truck, and, and um, how, what are we going to do? The Pockham the hotel isn't answering their phone, you know. We saw this police car go by, and we thought, well, we should ask him. And Robin said, no, they're not going to do anything for us. It's getting late. It's getting to be, it was already like 3.30, and we're supposed to be at a hotel by 4. And so, so then... Um, I got a hold of, my friend called me from the hotel and she said, that hotel that we had the reservation for is closed because of COVID. They actually, there's nobody there. I said, what, what did you do? And she said, well, we, we went across the street because they, they said everything that was on that hotel has changed over across the street now. No wonder nobody was answering the phone. So while I'm talking to her, this truck comes up. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, I said, honey, we have to talk to these people. We have to communicate with them somehow. So we walked over there, and I'm talking to my friend on the phone and uh, trying to explain to him what's going on. She, and my friend said, well, just a minute. The concierge is, is, speaks Spanish, and he can tell him there's no taxi, there's no bus, there's no way for us to get the hotel. And it's too far to walk with all our luggage. So they the hotel. The hotel people talked to the anti-narcotics unit and they finally agreed to take us to the hotel. <laughs> so we got a personal escort with a narcotics unit to the hotel because everything was shut down. And that was an answer to prayer. I know some of you here were praying and uh, that was an answer because we didn't know what we were going to do. And while we were waiting, a lady came by and she said, are you, are you going out? Are you, I, can't, I can't get my flight out. They canceled. And I said, well, try United. That's what we did. And she said, okay, I will. So she left. The next morning, go to the next slide. That's loading our stuff up. Next slide. This was in front of the hotel. The police he took our pictures, he wanted our names, he, he, that was a big deal for him. Next slide. So we, the next day, uh, the next morning we got, they had to be there at like four in the morning or some ridiculous time. And we're waiting in line and uh, here's this lady that we met the time before, the, the, night, the day before. And we said, you made it. She said, I got the last seat. On United. And that was the last flight out. And that was the last flight out till May, I don't know, whenever, whatever. So we thank you for all your prayers. We thank you for listening to us. We thank you for letting us share. And uh, before I go, I wanted to share a couple verses that were important to me about being a servant, no matter where you are or where you, or where you go. And this is Romans 12, verse 11. Be enthusiastic to serve the Lord, keeping your passion toward him boiling hot. Radiate with the glow of the Holy Spirit and let him fill you with the excitement as you serve him. And that's what we do when we go places and serve people. That's what we're doing. And then Philippians 2.11, you know, we can't do this without God. Spending time with God is what does it for us. God will continually, this is Philippians 2, 13, which some of you probably know. God will continually revitalize you 
implanting within you the passion to do what pleases him. He puts it in our hearts to serve him. He puts it in our hearts to want to please him. And that, we can't do it ourselves. Praise the Lord for that. So one thing I wanted to, to tell you is that one thing that I'm doing here, and Robin helps too, is that we come Wednesday morning at 9.30, 9.45, and we help with the community service center right here in your kitchen. And if you want to touch somebody's life, show up some, Sunday, some Wednesday. Talk to the people. You don't have to preach them a sermon. Just be their friend. Just say, hi, how are you today? And maybe they're not doing well, and you can pray with them. Maybe you can donate water. Maybe you can donate clothes or food. We used to uh, prepare meals, but since the COVID, we haven't been able to do meals anymore. But um, it's a wonderful experience, and God is at work there. Yeah, these people may be homeless. They may be addicted to drugs. They may have certain problems, but God loves them. And when we come, and we share with them God's word, we know that his word does not return to him void. So that's my challenge and my encouragement to you is reach out to your neighbor, maybe as a clerk at a, at a store you go to or somebody you work with or just reach out. Just reach out to those people. You never know what they're carrying. Thank you so much for letting us share and God bless you all. Praise God, your experience was wonderful, and by God's grace, you made it. I know how fulfilling doing this ministry because we are uh, also having this program in the Philippines. Um, in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Um, shall we all rise and sing hymnal 428, sweet by and by. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, that you love us. You care about us. You want us in your kingdom forever. You've forgiven us for everything. Lord, thank you that your people are all around this world, Lord, and you're calling them out to you. Oh, Lord, help us to be a part of that, that we could share your love with others. Thank you, Lord, for loving us 
and giving us the privilege of sharing your love to others. You are so magnificent. We worship and praise you today. In your holy name, amen.